Romans 12, um, notice what it says here. Go to verse 1 and 2, and I just want to lay some foundation for what we're going to be talking about in the upcoming weeks. Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable and perfect. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Holy Spirit, we give ourselves to you. Holy Spirit, we invite you to manifest yourself powerfully in this place. So God, as we just share for a few minutes from scriptures, open our hearts to just understand more of what you're saying. We want to be like you. So God, I move out of the way. I, I die so you may live and take residence on the throne of my life. I pray for clarity of mind, soundness of speech, that we will understand it requires a different thought process. So we give ourselves to you. Bless and have your way. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen, amen. and amen. We've been talking uh, about rebuilding um, God's kingdom, reestablishing God's kingdom here on earth. And for the past two weeks, we've talked a little bit about what that means and what that looks like. I want to review a little bit, and I want to take you down this path today to a passage that you've heard a million times, a passage that you probably have memorized, a passage that you've heard me speak about here um, at Restoration Christian Fellowship. But I just want to revisit that passage in the context of this series that we've been talking about to shed some light on some things as it relates to what God is saying and what God is doing in our midst. Here is what we've been sharing by way of a big idea when we were in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 18. And I want you to understand this as we walk through the text this morning. God's mission in the earth is to reestablish his kingdom by rescuing people from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Now, as kingdom subjects, let me just say this by way of introduction so we can segue into the text. When we talk about God reestablishing his kingdom on the earth, if you've been missing the series, I want to encourage you to either go to the podcast, go online, iTunes, YouTube, download it to get caught up. But the goal of God, the goal of God in the earth is to rescue people from the grips of the enemy and bring them into the kingdom of life. So God has an agenda. He wants to put an end to the enemy's kingdom so his kingdom can be established in the earth. Come on, does that make sense? Come on, say amen if it does. So with, with, that, with that big idea in mind, let me review a couple of the things that I shared to you last time. Let me apologize for the size of this. I didn't realize it was going to be this small. Here's what we said last week. God's kingdom should be subversive while invading the enemy's uh, territory. And here's what that means. God expects that we go out into the world and bring people into a relationship with him. The premise of what we shared with you last week, using uh, um, the famed lady Harriet Tubman as an example, that this is not so much an overt, loud, braggadocious, bringing attention to ourselves, we have to learn how to get into the enemy's territory, tear the enemy's territory down, and pull people out into the kingdom of God. Okay? Now, I need to flesh that out a little bit because um, sometimes when we think evangelism and we think evangelistically, we think loud, overt, announce our presence, announce our coming. And the reason a lot of us, a lot of people within the body of Christ are afraid to share their faith is because of what we've seen. Let me give you a subtle example, and then we're going to move through. I cannot help but visualize Jesus when he was on the earth. Now, I know this is going to be a little bit of radical stuff because I started this conversation Wednesday. Jesus would go to church on Sunday, and there was not a community event that the locals had that he would not be invited to. Okay? So here's what that looked like. Funeral ceremonies, he'd be there, right? Wedding ceremonies, he would be there. Dinner engagement, he would be there. And I'm processing this because I'm probably going to be speaking about this in the subject of kingdom. Listen to this carefully. Let me just give this away when we talk about subversion. Jesus gets invited to a wedding party, 
and the liquor ran out. I'm using that word intentionally for the church folk. The liquor ran out. And his mother said to him, come on, G, hook them up. <laughs> now, this is deep. This is deep. This is deep. We're going to flip. I'm talking about this in the upcoming week. And, and, and look at the subversion of Jesus. He was at the party, and nobody knew he was there. Oh, y'all got to get this. You got to get this. Nobody knew he was there but his mama because she knew who he was. Right? Here's how we would go to a party like, here's what it looks like. The Christian show up to the party and everybody starts hiding their stuff. <laughs> Come on, y'all, let's be honest here. Y'all not ready for this, but I, I want you to understand the subversive nature and how ineffective we are, right? So we got to know, and we'll talk about it. So he shows up and his mama says, hey, hook them up. And Jesus hooks them up, of course. And then here's what the people are saying. Man, where y'all buy this stuff from? <laughs> This ain't no, is it Manischewitz? Is that the cheap stuff? I'll tell you how much I know, right? I don't, I, y'all pray for me. I don't know much about anything, right? Um, but where'd you get this from? And, and my point in that is, number one, is the subversive nature that he can go into enemy territory, exist, be in it but not of it, and still be effective while he's there, right? I'm going to keep saying this over and over again. What's my problem? What's your problem? What's the church's problem? Right? So we talked about that. We showed how Harriet went, went in and she was able to get people and pull them out to be who God would have them to be. Here's the second thing I said to you last week, I mean, to, to, by way of review. To rebel against the kingdom of darkness, we must have a clear understanding of God's mission in the world. Right? Now, here, let, me, let me stick with my illustration. Jesus knew he didn't went to the party to party. Yeah. That's very, very important. You got to know why you're going, right? He knew his mission, okay? And he had a clear understanding of his mission because even while there, he's saying to mama, my time isn't yet. And here's the mission, to rescue people from the kingdom of darkness and then, two, to transfer them into the kingdom of light. Come on, say God's mission, God's mission. is to rescue, to rescue. And, transfer. and transfer. One more time, say God's mission, God's mission. is to rescue and to transfer. Now, I'm going to be brief. I'm going to be brief because I want to, I'm going to lay foundation and then we're going to pick this up. So here is me now. Here I'm going to use this statement by way of a transitional statement. So to exist in God's kingdom on earth, a transformation must take place. So here's the context for this. We're going to rescue people from the kingdom of darkness and we're going to transfer them into the kingdom of light. Now here's this. If we expect them to exist in the kingdom of light, listen to what I'm saying. A transformation must take place. Now lock into this. The transformation is not so much physical, but it is spiritual and mental and that transformation enables us to live in the world and not of it. Okay, illustration, illustration. Here's the importance of the transformation. If, if I think it's a physical transformation and it's not a mental or spiritual transformation, when I go back in, if I think it's, I just need to stop doing stuff, but I have not transformed my mind mentally or spiritually, guess what's going to happen to the body when it goes back in? It's going to give in. You kind of get what I'm saying? Okay, so I know this is weird. This is weird, right? And I'm going to help you out with the principle in the upcoming weeks. Quit trying to stop doing things and start transforming your mind. We're going to flesh this out, okay? Because this is the behavioral pattern. I need to stop doing. I need to stop doing. I need to stop doing. But we do nothing for the transformation to take place, the spiritual transformation. And the reason we keep failing in the world so much is because we keep telling ourselves, I need to stop doing. I need to stop doing. And we don't spend no time saying, I need to start being or becoming. Yeah. Yeah. Big difference, okay? So that transformation enables us to live in the world yet not be of it. So here's what Romans 12 says. This is literally in the ESV. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, or renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable 
and perfect. One more time. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. Okay? Here, here is a, uh, a Gilbert translation. Yeah, Gilbert translation. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Here's what Gilbert translation says. Yeah, I'm going to write one of them one day. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may learn how to live in the kingdom of God. Yeah. That's, that's, that, I want you to get that, okay? Because a lot of us don't know what God's will is, what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect. So I want to summarize it this way. Don't be, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may learn how to live in the kingdom. Now, here's, let me, let me, the sermon's not going to be long. When I live in the kingdom, I am in God's will. I am doing what is good and acceptable, and I am pleasing in the eyes of God. Right? That's when I'm living in the kingdom. So let's walk through the text, and um, let's see what the text says. So notice what, um, number one, here's what I want you to take away from the text as you walk through this very, very carefully. Kingdom living requires, number one, that our bodies become living sacrifice for kingdom purposes. Now, this is going to sound a little bit backwards, but walk this out with me, okay? Kingdom living requires that our bodies become living sacrifice for kingdom purposes. Come on, repeat on me. Say self. self. To be in God's kingdom, be in God's kingdom. I, must I must sacrifice my body. One more time. Say self. self. To be in God's kingdom. I must sacrifice my body. Look at verse 1. Look at Romans 12 and 1. Paul begins by saying, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, and let's just for the sake of conversation, um, ignore the phrase therefore because we're not going to go back and do a lot of literary context. I just want to land on verse 2. I appeal to you, brothers, by God's mercies, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And then it says, this is your spiritual act of worship. So here's what Paul is saying as we look at this text, if our bodies need to become living sacrifice for the purposes of God. That word appeal means, Paul is saying, I make a, a, a pledge, I make an a, a earnest uh, appeal, I am begging, I am, I am asking, I am pleading with you, kingdom subjects, notice what, based on what God has done. Okay, I want to use that translation for an intentional purpose. I am making an appeal or I am pleading with you kingdom subject based on what God has done. Or notice what he says, based on the mercies of God. Now, the reason I want to point that out real quick is that the word mercies is not singular. It is plural, okay? So here's what that means, that if you're like me, there's a lot of things that God has done for you to show mercy, meaning where we should have been punished for certain things, he graced us. Okay, see, because here, here's the mistake we're making. We're confusing grace with mercy. Yeah, yeah. Mercy means, I mean, grace means unmerited favor, right? We all get that. But here's what mercy says. We should have died, but we didn't. You kind of get what I'm saying? Grace says I'm forgiven. That's easy, right? Thank God for the forgiveness that I'm forgiven. Mercy says that I'm not suffering the consequences for my sin. Oh, Lord Jesus. Come on now. And then, and listen to the text. Based on what God has done, based on God's mercy. So it wasn't like he forgave me once and didn't let me suffer the consequence once. There's been a bunch of things I've done because in the forgiveness, I messed around and go do it again. Come on, y'all. And I should have suffered the consequence again, but he forgave me again. And I did it again, and I should have suffered more consequences. But he, come on, y'all. So based on every, maybe y'all, ain't done nothing. Maybe you haven't done anything. Come on. Where, where you feel we deserve the life, but by virtue of the fact that you're breathing, you're under the sound of my voice, you're not here because you deserve to be here. God's mercies. So based on what God did, based on what God did, notice what Paul says. The least you can do is present your bodies as what? Oh my gosh. 
Listen, let me, let me flesh out that living sacrifice. Let me go to the Old Testament cultic system. Here's what the Old Testament does. When a person sinned, they would take a cow and they would kill the cow or kill the calf or kill the sheep or kill the bird or kill the goat and they would take this thing and they would lay it on the altar before God. In the Old Testament, the thing didn't have a choice because it was dead when they placed it on the altar. Here's what Paul is asking. The same principle of the Old Testament cultic system. God wants you on the altar, but he don't want to literally kill you and then force you to the altar. So here's what he wants you to do. Realize that we don't deserve to be walking around and take our bodies of our own free will. Let me do it from down here. And walk up to the altar and climb up on it and just lay there while you're alive. Oh, y'all aren't ready for this. And just lay there. In other words, don't for, have nobody force you to go there, but you offer yourself on, I wish I had somebody, on the altar. This is what her grandma then would say, while you're yet breathing. Now that's different, right? Because it's one thing, it's one thing when I find myself in a difficult situation to have to go, it's another thing for everything to be okay and I go lay on the altar volitionally and here's the thing, God purge me, God clean me, God take it out, God make me right so I can be right as a living sacrifice, lock into this, so while I am walking on the earth, what I do looks like what God wants done, not what Felix wants to do different living sacrifices, right? Come on, is this making sense? Come on, say, be a living sacrifice. One more time, say, be a living sacrifice. And then that word holy, ageo, right? Be holy, and it says, and acceptable to God. And I love this word. Let me, let me just translate it. This is your, some of your translation says, spiritual act of worship, okay? This is the offering that you bring to God. Let me help you out. When we hear worship, most of us know worship only in the sense of proskuneo, meaning I pray, I bow before the Lord, and I just offer up my words to God. In the Old Testament cultic system, when you went to church, you came and you wanted God to do something for you, but you offered something to God, right? So here's what it looks like at the onset of the New Testament. Folk would come to church and they'd forget their offering or their sacrifice. So what happened was the money changer set it up, set up in the church where if you forgot your sheep, they have a sheep for sale. Because you couldn't go in without, y'all get it? Yeah. If you forgot your goat, they had goats for sale. Come on, y'all. And, and they, had, they had a whole system set up within the church such that when people came to worship, if they didn't bring a sacrifice, you can buy one. This is why Jesus, when he showed up in the temple, here's what he says. He overturned the tables of the money changers, and he said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves, okay? So within that concept, here's what the New Testament says. God doesn't want you to bring a sheep, and he doesn't want you to bring a goat, and he doesn't want you to bring a bull to offer to him in worship. He wants you to bring yourself. Yeah. And then say, Lord... Oh, y'all not ready for this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so here's the thing. What, what are you bringing to worship today? God, I am bringing me as the living. Here, here's the Greek word, latreo, right? So God, I come and I kneel before you and I utter words of praise to you. But in the same time, I bring you me, clean me, cleanse me, make me whole. So when you look at me, I am pleased, Right? Now, here's the flip side of this. Here's the flip side, because I said I don't want to be long. Look at verse 12. So here's how you do this. And let me, let me put the second thing on the screen, because I want you all to get this real quick. Living in God's kingdom is not based on secular molds. It is based on God's established what? Everybody say patterns. Yes. Patterns. Say, come on, say God's patterns. Yes. Now, this is where we're going to work. I'm going to lay this, and we're going to pick this up next week. Do not be conformed to this world 
but be, what's the word? How? By the renewal of your mind, let me keep reading, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Let me stop here. Do not be conformed. So here's the meat of what we've been teaching for the past few weeks and what we'll be teaching for a long time. God's mission in the world is to transfer people from the kingdom of darkness to place them into the kingdom of light. Living in the kingdom of light, light looks nothing like living in the kingdom of darkness. You kind of get what I'm saying. The kingdom of darkness has, listen to the term, its mold and its patterns. You do things this way. You fight this way. You speak this way. You conduct yourself this way. When people wrong you, you defend yourself this way. So here's the thing, here's the thing. When God brings you out and he places you over here, the way you did things over there is not acceptable in the kingdom of light. So watch this. Here's how the transformation takes place is that once you're in here, conformity to the patterns of the world must stop. Okay, now here's what I said at the onset of the message. Quit trying to do it yourself, right? I talked about your bodies being living sacrifice, all that stuff. Now let me flip the script. So I need to stop saying to myself, Felix, you need to stop doing this. Felix, you need to stop doing that. And church, here it is. This is going to sound confusing to you. We need to stop telling people they need to stop doing. Here's what we need to say to them. Change your mindset. Uh, and then help them change their mindset, right? Because here's the thing. If I came out of the world, my mindset is based on the patterns of the world. And if you tell me to stop behaving a certain way, but my mindset is still in the mind of the world, guess what my mindset is going to tell my body to do? Behave like the world, right? So that word conform, don't be conformed. It's an interesting Greek word because it talks about being molded in, being shaped in. It's kind of like if you ever went to the mint, and, and bless, I, I really haven't gone to a mint, but, but here's what happens in the mint, right? I, I've read this, is that there's a mold that they poured the, melt, the melted metal into such that when it hardens, you can take the thing out and the thing looked like the mold it was poured into. Right? So here's what God is saying. Don't, don't, don't conform yourself to the mold that the world has shaped and the world has developed, but a transformation needs to take place. And that word transformation is the Greek word that's translated, translated a metamorphosis needs to take place so we can now form into the mold or the pattern of God's kingdom, right? So here's what he says. Here's how you do this. He says, don't be conformed to the pattern of the word, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Now, the best illustration I can give you is, give you is one I used a week ago. Grandma and them, a few weeks ago, Grandma and them didn't have much theology, right? So here's what they'd wake up saying. I woke up this morning, y'all know the song, with my what? Mind stayed on Jesus, right? I'm singing and I'm talking with my mind stayed on Jesus, right? Wherever I go, my mind is stayed on Jesus because lock into this. If my mind is stayed on Jesus, guess what's going to follow? Yeah, you get it, you get it, you get it. Lock into this. The reason I sin is not because my body said I feel like sinning. The reason I sin is because my mind communicated to my body that you have this desire, go meet it. And here's what happens. My body now follows the dictates of my mind. And so what the scripture says, quit trying to stop doing stuff. Hear me, change your mind, and by default, your default state is going to be the things of God versus the things of the world. Oh, my gosh. So if I'm going to develop a kingdom mindset, I need to spend some time So here's this. Y'all know this one in Corinthians. When temptation comes, it's going to come not to my hand, not to my feet, not to my body. It's going to come where? And listen to what Scripture says in Corinthians. Take the thought captive and do what? 
submitted to the things of Christ. Okay? Then when it runs through the filters of this, your body's going to respond accordingly. But if you don't run it through the filters, through the biblical filters that's now implanted in your mind, the body's going to have a tension all day long. Here's David's words. Thy word have I hidden. Where? Why? That I may not do what? Oh, you're getting it. You're getting it. You're starting to get it, right? Right? So here's what it says in Timothy. Study, destroy yourself, approve unto God, work persons that need not be ashamed, rightly divided in the word of God. So here's what that means. If I'm going to be in the kingdom, and if I'm thinking kingdom looks like the world, and here's what we've been saying. Kingdom is not some eschatological concept that lives way out there. Kingdom is now. Kingdom is here. And God expects us to live in the kingdom here. So if we want to see kingdom, if we want to understand kingdom, a transformation needs to, under, to, to go to take place in our mind, and when that transformation takes place in our mind, it places us spiritually, and let me even go as far as to say literally in kingdom now. And so here's the thing. The only way we can see and understand kingdom now is that a transformation of the mind must take place. It's a mental and spiritual concept that allows us to live it out physically in the here and now. So if my mind has changed, listen to this, I can go back to where God delivered me from and not be tempted by it because I am a new person in Christ. But if I've been rescued and I have not undergone transformation, temptation is still going to be prominent. Can we be honest this morning, guys? Does this make sense? Transformation must take place. Let me give you this last one, then we're going to stop um, because I, I don't want to overwhelm you with this. Here's the thing. Living in God's kingdom is not based on secular mo. That's the, the, the second one. Let me give you this last one. The result of a renewed mind is a revelation of life in the kingdom of God. So here's what we've been saying all along. Jesus came on earth, and he came to model kingdom living, right? So notice his mindset before he acted before he did, before he behaved, here's what he said. I do nothing unless the Father tells me. He filtered every behavior to the things of God. Right? So here's how we do it. Galatians 2 and 20. I am crucified every day with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives where? And the life I live in the flesh I live after the Son of God who died and gave himself for me. So here, I want to put the statement back up, and I want to wrap this up here. To exist in God's kingdom on earth, a transformation must take place. And that transformation is not physical. It is spiritual and mental. And here's what the transformation does. It enables me to live in the world, yet not be of it. Closing illustration. If I am constantly struggling with the world, I need to check the transformation or the transformative process that I've undergone and make sure that my mind is cleaned up some more. So here's how Jesus says it. I'm the vine. You're the what? Notice what he says. Abide where? Right? Any vine that's not in me does not bear fruit. Listen to this. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. So listen to this. Abide in me, and I wear in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Oh, my gosh. Kingdom. If I'm in kingdom, it's all about God living in me, me obeying God and doing what God says. So here's what this means. This is hard. I'm going to stop here. I can't be in kingdom and allow my earthly emotions to dictate behaviors and then say, I'm completely in kingdom. Conflict. Listen to this. This is going to mess you up. A house divided against itself. <laughs> so if I'm saying I'm in kingdom and God says, love your neighbor, but God, y'all know what she did to me. Mm-mm. And you fighting with God in kingdom? Go ahead and own it. <laughs> yeah, you get it. The fence is here. And you got one foot, and you haven't completely crossed over yet. And to be honest about it, church, and I'm done, that's a lot of the things we wrestle with 
and we don't want to be own up the truth and go ahead and cross over and completely obey God. I beseech you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Don't be conformed anymore to the patterns of this world, verse 2 says, but be what? Transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able, here's my translation, and I want to put this back up here because I really like it myself. Um, <laughs> by testing, you will learn how to live in the kingdom of God. Yes. So, practical step, and I'm done. Lately, I haven't been getting as mad as I should or could with my lovely wife because I keep reminding myself, you in kingdom. <laughs> so I let her win more. Come on, does this make sense? Amen. That's what it looks like in my life, right? When I want to get upset, I have to check myself, I take the thought captive, submit it to God because I want to stay in the kingdom, right? Because there's joy in the kingdom. There's peace. Come on, y'all. In the kingdom. Come on. There's provision in the kingdom. Y'all not hearing me. Come on. There's blessing in the kingdom. And I don't want to compromise all God has in store for me by allowing the enemy to continually have access to my mind to plant seeds of doubt to cause me to go to the edge and step over every now and then. I'm done with that. Because his mission is for me to go in and to grab people and to bring them out. And I can't lose sight of what his mission is. Does anybody in here want a renewed mind this morning? Come on, just, just, amen. Come on, come on, amen. Bow your heads with me. Here's what I want to do. I want to just take a moment to pray. And here's what prayer looks like this morning. Contemplative, reflective, saying, God, don't so much my neighbor or my spouse, but me, but me. So while, wherever you are, I want you to reflect and just process with me this morning and ask yourself, what is God saying to me as it relates to what a revelation of kingdom is and me living in his kingdom because he wants to reestablish his kingdom in the earth? Holy Spirit, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you're doing, God. You're a gracious God. You're a forgiving God. You're a loving God. You're a merciful God. And God, as we begin this process of getting deeper and deeper into what kingdom is all about. We're just on the brink, and we're finding out we need to change our mind. we got to change our mindset. We have to adjust our mindset. We've been hearing this a long time, but we really don't know what it means. So, Holy Spirit, continue to show us and reveal yourself in us, God. Should there be one here today that don't know you as Lord and Savior, a renewal mind begins with a relationship with God. Draw them, God, saying, I want to know God like that. I want God to help me to renew my mind. I want to commit myself to him so my mind can be renewed. God, draw that individual into a relationship with you. Thank you for who you are and what you're doing. You're a wonderful, gracious God. We give our time to you this morning. Be glorified in our midst. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen.